Give us the grace of repentance that we may live our lives in accordance with the teachings of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The reading prescribed by the Church for this day's Holy Mass is taken from the Old Testament book of Exodus. Moses was keeping his flock with his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come, come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Here ends the lesson prescribed for the, by the church for this day's holy mass. Thanks be to God. You, O Lord, are our throne forever. Your throne stands from age to age. Why then should you forget us and abandon us so long a time? We give us back to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Give us a new such days as we have old. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. <coughs> Almighty and eternal God, cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. Cleanse my heart and my lips with your gracious mercy, that I may worthy and proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthy and proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, some people who were present here told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them in reply, do you think that because these Galileans suffered this way, that they were greater sinners than all the other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. 
There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. When he came in search of fruit on it, he found none. He said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, but I have never found any. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? And he said to him, Reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it, and it may bear fruit in the future. If not, then you can cut it down. By the words of this holy gospel, may our sins be forgiven. <coughs> Jesus' day. 
Jesus reveals in today's gospel that their pain has absolutely nothing to do with God's judgment. He says they did not suffer, they were not more evil than anybody else, and God caused them that suffering. And Jesus said that's not what, the way God works. Suffering is not willed by God, but it has to be allowed by God. At Wednesday's Lenten discussion, it was brought up that a survey has shown that people really truly appreciate a God of all love more than they appreciate a God who's all powerful. God can't prevent every bad thing from happening and still let us be free and intelligent beings created in His image. If we have freedom, then we have to have the potential for bad happening in our world because if God controlled everything and didn't allow bad things to happen, well, we wouldn't be us. But God can love us no matter how bad we are suffering. And I think that is one of the fundamental reasons for the cross. Every one of us here recognizes the cross, especially at this time of the year. We're halfway through our Lenten journey. The cross should become more and more familiar. In addition to all of the other crosses we have in this church building, during Lent we place one huge cross right there at our communion room. Everyone paying even a little bit of attention during Mass can't miss that cross. It is huge. But why the cross? A lot of theologians argue that we have been saved the very moment that Jesus was born. Christmas is where we found our salvation. So maybe not all the way to the cross, maybe right here on the first day that Jesus ever had earth. The cross wasn't necessary in that sense, maybe. So the cross was maybe necessary as a consequence of Jesus being unprotected from all of the meanness and the randomness of this world, just like we're unprotected from all of that. Because Jesus has experienced human suffering, and I mean horrible human suffering. Hopefully we never have to have any kind of suffering like that. God has experienced human suffering because Jesus has, and therefore in our most desperate moments, when we feel absolutely alone, when we feel that the suffering is almost unbearable, even if God at that time feels so far away that we can ask, where is God? At those moments, because of the cross, there is the all-loving power of God to stand there right beside us and to hold us up because He has been there in Jesus. In Steve Damon's presentation this past Wednesday, he mentioned a couple of times that during Lent, there is no celebration. This is a time for reflection and even reward. Easter will come, and with it will come rejoicing. But we're not there yet. That's a whole other season. And I like that distinction because Lent ends not with an empty tomb, Lent ends on Holy Saturday with Jesus dead, whole dead in that tomb. When Jesus goes to the cross, we think maybe he can't be certain about Easter either. The spring was so impassioned from his cross that it is recorded for us in the original language. It just it burned itself into the memory of those first Christians so they do not translate it into the text. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is on the cross and he's wondering where God is. Where's God? That same question about suffering. Where's God? Jesus is on the cross. And he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, where are you? And what a shocking statement of utter bewilderment when we realize that that is on the lips of the Son of God. It is God himself experiencing the full, blunt force of our limited human condition. His mortality is real at that moment. We can't sugarcoat and say, well, he knows that Easter is going to come. His mortality, his pain, his grief is real. His uncertainty about death is real. His limitations are as real as ours, or else he doesn't die like we do. In the oldest account, there is no calm. It is finished, like in John's Gospel. Rather, if you read the end of Mark's gospel, all there is is a loud, desperate, inarticulate scream. Jesus just screams at the end of his life. That Jesus that he suffered is undeniable, but there's more to it than just suffering because suffering is everywhere. To suffer is sadly unexceptional because there is so much suffering in our world. Like I said, we have to put up firewalls or else we just, we just couldn't handle it if we took everything personally. But Jesus not only suffered, Jesus was rejected specifically because of his suffering. When suffering usually brings out compassion, hopefully when you heard about that grandmother who fell to her knees because of her three-year-old grandchild, hopefully something in your heart, that compassion was there for her, even though you have no idea who that woman is, but that compassion is there. It was the opposite 
when Jesus died. His followers lost faith in him and deserted him because of the very reason that he suffered. This was not the Messiah they wanted, a conquering, triumphant Messiah. Peter not only fled, he denied Jesus. It even says in the Bible, he began to curse. Did he curse Jesus because he was so upset? This is not only Peter's fear. This is Peter's rejection of a suffering Messiah. There are no disciples. There are no friends. There is no family at the cross to comfort Jesus, according to Mark. The ones for whom he is dying, they mocked and reviled him as they passed by. Just, you know, they're going into Jerusalem. They see a guy dying on the cross, and they revile him, and they make fun of him. The religious authorities laughed at the thought that this was supposed to lead the Son of God. And look at him up there on the cross. His rejection is nearly universal. Mark tells us that there were only a few women, and they were looking on, it says in that first gospel, from a safe distance away. Jesus has no one. Rejection robs suffering of any dignity. And this is the suffering of our Savior. Our suffering is not because God doesn't care. Where is God? Our suffering is the reason that God cares enough to face the rejected suffering of the cross. Hopefully, this quote-unquote news about suffering is more noteworthy than it rained today, like I heard on the news Wednesday. And hopefully it may reawaken our appreciation for the loving sacrifice of Christ drawing us ever closer to such a Savior. We're halfway through Lent. Hopefully we're a little bit closer to him than when we started on Ash Wednesday. But we have a whole other half to become even more like Jesus and appreciate what that means. And in his name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Lord, as we gather before your altar on this third Sunday of Lent, we offer our prayers for John Copinto, who passed away last Saturday on February 20th. We also remember Anna Garfield. Um, we also remember Anna Garfield, and this is being offered by Mary Gardner and family, and Cliff Factor and Carl Garfield. We offer our prayers in memory of Rose Girardi, who passed away on February 20th, 2014, as offered by Bill and Teresa Girardi. We also offer our prayers for the health of Benjamin St. George, recently diagnosed with brain tumors, now at Mass General, as offered by Teresa Mason. We continue to offer our prayers for others battling cancer. Doug Robinson, my daughter Jenny Whitman, and Karen Herzig. Tom Nidal, by Teresa Belisle. Meg Connors by Ellen and Don Strauss, Marie Logan and Carl Dickinson by Joe and Peg Buster, Randy Clements by her grandmother, Dottie Baronas, and also fathers Jan Bielczyk, Ray Dreda, and Maurice Lozell is offered by myself, and also a new prayer for a young child by the name of Max, only three years old, with a rare form of cancer, now hospitalized in Boston. Are there any other prayers that you would like to offer from the congregation? I know we've been praying, we were praying for John Whitney while he was battling cancer, and, and we did when he died. This morning is his celebration of life, and uh, I know he, he was a neighbor of Diane's, and his kids are very young. And there'll be a lot of families there with young children, and I just want to pray for all of them that, uh, that they may understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll pray for John Whitten and all those who are grieving his passing. Any other intentions? For all of these, Lord, those are private intentions that we bring before your altar. And we also ask the Lord to bless each and every one of us here gathered, to be with those who are our parish who are not able to be with us here today, and also those who are our parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven.
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Yes, it was the name, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. May they rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit to the Lord and the Virgin Mary, and he came in. For our sake, he was crucified by the conscious Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again and fulfilled his scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, with the God and the Son, to be worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism with the forgiveness of sins, by the Lord of the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you.
Lord our God, you call us to return to you. Receive these gifts of the, of the Mass that we offer to you as a sign of our repentance. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Throughout all ages of ages, Whoever believes in me will 
never be thirsty. After these loving words of the archpriest in prayer and the first, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and eat of this, for this is my body. taking also this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to you. He blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and drink of this, for this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which for you and for many shall be shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me.
unity of spirit, which he bestowed on the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed apostles, martyrs, and all of those who resolutely marched under the banner of our Savior, that being supported by your help, may always be free from sin and secure from all despair. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Throughout all ages of ages,
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thank you. 